Hey folks, um, today we're gonna tackle a topic that's absolutely crucial for your CFA level one exam. And let's be honest, for your careers in finance too. We're diving into the nitty gritty of the differences between accounting profit and taxable income and how that leads us into the world of deferred tax assets and liabilities. Now, I know taxes might not be the most thrilling subject on the planet, but stick with me. We'll make sense of it together and I'll throw in some real world examples to keep things grounded. Sound good? All right, let's get this show on the road. First off, let's set the stage. In the financial world, tax laws and financial accounting standards don't always see eye to eye. This mismatch leads to differences between what's reported as accounting profit and what's considered taxable income. So let's kick things off by clearing up some confusion right away. When we talk about tax laws and financial accounting standards, we're actually dealing with two different rule books. These differences create variations between what we call accounting profit or income before taxes and taxable income. And here's where it gets interesting. These variations can either be temporary, leading to deferred tax assets and liabilities, or permanent, which won't ever change. Think of it like this. Temporary differences are like a bend in the road. It'll straighten out eventually. But permanent differences? They're like a dead end. They're here to stay. Imagine you're reading two cookbooks that both claim to make the perfect lasagna, but they have different ingredient lists. Similarly, tax laws and accounting standards have different recipes for calculating income, leading to variations that can be either temporary or permanent. Temporary differences are like seasonal ingredients. They affect the flavor now, but even out over time. These differences are the breeding ground for deferred tax assets and liabilities. As future financial gurus, you need to grasp how these timing differences impact the income tax effects of current activities, even if the tax consequences hit down the line. Why should you care about this? Because these differences directly influence the effective tax rate, which analysts use to estimate after-tax profitability. The effective tax rate, which gets influenced by these differences, is a big deal when you're estimating after-tax profitability measures. Analysts pay close attention to this rate because it affects investment decisions and company valuations. Oh, and don't forget, companies usually spill the beans about their income tax details in the notes to their financial statements. So always make sure to dig into those disclosures when you're analyzing a company. So why don't these two numbers match up? Well, it's because the guidelines for financial reporting and tax reporting are different. It's like using metric measurements in one recipe and imperial in another. You're bound to get different results. The key differences between accounting profit and taxable income. Accounting profit, also known as income before taxes or pre-tax income, is what companies report on their financial statements before deducting tax expenses. It's like the headline number that shows how well a company did over a period. Taxable income, on the flip side, is the amount upon which the company actually pays taxes, according to the taxman's rules. It's calculated based on tax laws, which can differ significantly from accounting standards. All right, let's break this down. Imagine two friends, accounting profit and taxable income, going to a party, but they both have different dress codes to follow. Accounting profit, which is income before taxes, follows financial reporting guidelines, IFRS or GAAP while taxable income is dressed according to the tax laws of the country. Naturally, these differences can cause a bit of a clash. This is where we introduce the concept of deferred taxes. Deferred tax assets and liabilities pop up due to timing differences in recognizing revenues and expenses. 
Think of it like a loan between the company and the tax authorities. The tax man says, I'll collect this later, or I'll give you a break now and collect less later. For example, let's say a company uses accelerated depreciation for tax purposes to save on taxes today, but uses straight line depreciation for accounting purposes. The result? A deferred tax liability because for accounting purposes, the company reports higher profits now and lower profits later. But hey, the tax authority will catch up. Temporary differences are differences that will self-correct over time. They're the source of deferred tax assets and liabilities. Permanent differences. Now, some differences aren't temporary. They're set in stone. These are called permanent differences. These are the kind of differences that are like your high school rival. You're never going to see eye to eye. These differences arise from items that are treated differently for accounting and tax purposes and will not reverse over time. For example, fines and penalties are expensed in accounting but aren't tax deductible. These don't create deferred tax items but do affect the effective tax rate. For instance, if a company receives dividends from a subsidiary that are not taxable, this creates a permanent difference. Or consider expenses like fines or penalties. These might be expenses according to accounting standards, but the tax authority says, nope, we're not covering that. Deductible temporary differences. So, deductible temporary differences are basically those that help reduce taxes in the future. This creates what's called a deferred tax asset, which is a fancy way of saying you'll get some tax relief down the road. For assets, you get a deferred tax asset when the tax base, what the tax authorities say the asset is worth, is bigger than what the asset is currently worth on your books. For liabilities, you get a deferred tax asset when the liability on your books is worth more than what the tax authorities say it's worth. Now, how do we figure out if these deferred tax assets will actually come in handy in the future? Well, we need to consider a couple of things. There need to be enough taxable temporary differences connected to the same tax authority and entity both the taxable and deductible temporary differences should reverse around the same time. Let's walk through some real-world examples of taxable and deductible differences. Dividends receivable from a subsidiary, for instance, aren't treated as income under tax laws, which creates a permanent difference between taxable income and what's reported in the accounting books interest or rent received in advance both create temporary differences since you recognize that income for tax purposes at a different time than in accounting. Loans, on the other hand, don't result in any temporary differences, so no deferred tax is involved there. Government grants aren't deductible when determining the tax base, which leads to a permanent difference, meaning no deferred tax asset or liability arises. Donations can be expensed for accounting, but they aren't deductible for tax purposes, resulting in a permanent difference that won't reverse in the future. Now, let's dig into Deferred Tax Assets, DTAs, and Deferred Tax Liabilities, DTLs. Think of these as a yin and yang of the tax world, opposites that balance each other out. Deferred Tax Assets. Think of this like a tax refund in the future. A DTA happens when you paid more tax now and expect to get some relief later. This is like a credit on your taxes. A deferred tax asset pops up when the company will save on taxes in the future. This can occur when the tax base of an asset is higher than its carrying amount. For example, if a company has a tax loss carry forward, meaning they can use past losses to offset future taxable income, that's a deferred tax asset. Another example, warranty expenses. 
For accounting, they're recorded now, but for tax purposes, they might not be deductible until they're actually paid out. Boom, another deferred tax asset. Deferred tax liability, DTL. On the flip side, DTLs represent taxes that you owe in the future because you've got a break today. Now, imagine the tax man giving you a break now, but saying, don't get too comfy. I'm coming back for more later. This happens when you recognize revenue for accounting purposes before it's taxable. Using our earlier example, if a company depreciates an asset faster for tax purposes to reduce taxable income now, they create a deferred tax liability knowing that they'll pay more tax in the future. A deferred tax liability arises when the company will owe more tax in the future due to temporary differences. This typically happens when the carrying amount of an asset on the balance sheet is higher than its tax base. For example, using accelerated depreciation for tax purposes but straight line for accounting increases the book value of the asset compared to its tax value, leading to a DTL. Consider a tech company that sells software subscriptions. For tax purposes, the income might be taxed when received, but for accounting, it's spread out over the subscription period. This creates a deferred tax liability because for accounting, the revenue is recognized over time, but for tax purposes, it's all upfront. Now, there are some important considerations. Under both IFRS and US GAAP, Deferred tax assets are recognized only if it's probable that future taxable profits will be available to utilize the asset. It means if the company is expected to continue as a going concern and can actually realize the benefits in the future, if the company's future is shaky, we can't just assume these deferred tax assets or liabilities will pan out. Under U.S. GAAP, if there's uncertainty about recovering a deferred tax asset, a valuation allowance is used to reduce its value on the balance sheet. Now, let's talk rates, corporate income tax rates, that is. This is where things can get a bit tricky, especially for multinational companies. Companies operate in different countries with different tax rates, and this is where it gets complicated. The statutory tax rate is the official rate set by the government. It is the legally imposed income tax rate in the company's home country. But companies often report an effective tax rate that's different. Why? Because of the various deductions, credits, and the fact that they operate in multiple jurisdictions. Effective tax rate is what the company actually ends up paying calculated as income tax expense divided by pre-tax accounting income. The effective tax rate is a blended rate, a sort of weighted average of the rates in all the countries they operate in. Analysts need to be on their toes here. If a company's effective rate is much lower than the statutory rate, it's time to dig deeper and see why. Maybe they have a lot of tax credits, or perhaps they operate in low tax regions. If a company has a lot of permanent differences, like non-taxable income or non-deductible expenses, its effective tax rate, the tax rate reported on the financial statements, could differ significantly from the statutory rate set by the government. Think of the statutory rate as the official rate and the effective rate as the real world rate. It's important because effective tax rate reflects the actual rate the company is paying, which can differ from the statutory rate due to these temporary and permanent differences. The cash tax rate is another concept we throw around. It's about the actual cash paid during a period divided by pre-tax income. While the effective tax rate helps in forecasting earnings, the cash tax rate is more about understanding cash flows. Imagine a U.S.-based company that earns 50% of its income domestically and 50% in a country with a lower tax rate. 
if the U.S. statutory rate is 21% and the foreign rate is 10%, the effective tax rate will be a weighted average of these rates, potentially lowering the overall tax burden. Finally, let's talk about how all of this is presented in financial statements. The devil is in the details here, and those details are usually found in the notes to financial statements. Companies must provide a reconciliation between their effective tax rate and the statutory rate. This tells investors where the differences are coming from. Are there a lot of one-time tax credits? Are there substantial operations in low-tax jurisdictions? Are there significant deferred tax assets or liabilities? Companies have to provide clear, detailed notes on their tax situation, like a roadmap for analysts. For instance, both IFRS and U.S. GAAP allow the offsetting of deferred tax assets and liabilities only when it's legally allowed, and both relate to the same tax authority. Under IFRS, companies must show deferred tax assets and liabilities as separate line items, while under U.S. GAAP, in a classified statement of financial position, they're classified as non-current. U.S. GAAP classifies deferred tax items as non-current, regardless of when they're expected to reverse. If a company has a significant deferred tax liability due to accelerated depreciation, you might see a note explaining how much of the liability is expected to reverse in the next 12 months versus later. Why it matters? The answer is transparency and comparability. These disclosures help analysts understand the factors affecting the company's tax rates and future tax obligations. Knowing how to read these notes allows for better comparisons between companies, especially those operating in different jurisdictions. If you look at a company's annual report, you'll often find a table in the notes section that reconciles the statutory tax rate to the effective tax rate. It might list items like tax-exempt income, non-deductible expenses, foreign tax rate differences, and so on. All right, everyone, that was a deep dive into deferred taxes. By now, you should understand the difference between accounting profit and taxable income, what deferred tax assets and liabilities are, and how they impact a company's financial statements. Remember, deferred taxes are all about timing, but they have real-world implications for cash flows and profitability. But when analyzing a company, always keep an eye on these differences and what they mean for the company's financial health and future tax obligations. Whether you're preparing for your CFA exams or analyzing a stock for a portfolio, mastering this topic gives you a serious edge. Companies use these tax strategies for legitimate reasons, but as analysts, it's our job to know how these affect the bottom line, the risk profile, and ultimately, the investment decision. So, next time you're combing through a set of financials, think about what's real, what's deferred, and what's just not going to happen. That's the power of understanding deferred taxes. Dive into some practice questions to reinforce what you have covered.